Welcome, Stephen, to the Ground Investigation podcast. As always, if you could give us a, could give a brief background of yourself. Oh, well, yeah, thanks for the welcome, Michael. Uh, I'm Stephen Farrer, or Steve, uh, from AD Estrelin. I'm Associate Director of Operations there. I've um, been in the ground investigation industry for 18 years this year. I've uh, been in the world of work probably for 20. I started yep. straight out of Derby University. 2003 for a for a company called flow gas which aren't directly in the, in the ground investigation industry and kind of a couple of months in each of their departments a couple of months in sales a couple of months in transport logistics commercial installations and maintenance and ended up um, in their installations and maintenance designing high pressure liquefied petroleum gas uh, installations which had a bit of a crossover with with si that was just to break the cycle really uh, of getting experience yep. and then moved into SI with a company called uh, Meerbrook Geo Services, which was my first break in insight investigation with a gentleman called Simon Hassel. They, mm-hmm. They're now called IDOM, reasonably large, well, large for a small consultant, if you catch my drift. But um, yeah, they've got a few offices. Yeah. They're owned by a Spanish company. A uh, couple of years there, cutting my teeth in site investigation, supervising rigs, then moved into... Uh, Banel, Banel Geotechnical, which uh, with the geotechnical arm of Banel, they've now re- rebranded as uh, Strata Geotech. Strata, yeah. Yeah, and then worked initially as an engineer, then contract manager, and then the recession came along, and I got my fingers in various pies there, but it was kind of a mix of, of engineering and contract management, and pile testing, and involved with, with other projects within the group. And then uh-huh. uh, did that for seven years uh, lots to talk about there i'm sure and then moved over to well, moved my whole family to the southwest to work for geotechnical yeah. engineering limited again a variety of roles in geotechnical engineering started off there as a as a geotechnical consultant which will raise a few eyebrows because yeah. anyone that that knows me knows that's not what i'm about uh so i think i did no. a couple of months what five months there then they had a bit of a reshuffle because geotechnical engineering were changing the way they they did things and then I started in, a, in an operational capacity in the engineering team. Mm-hmm. We can talk about that a bit, bit later on, but there's, there's a, again, a lot to talk about there. And then most recently working for, for ADS um, as part of the part of the team there of uh, a growing drilling company in ADS Midlands and mm-hmm. a long established drilling company in, in the form of ADS drilling down in the Southwest. So yeah, that's a potted history of me, really. Well, perfect. That's a good, good history of yourself up to the present day. So what, what kind of turned you on to the geology degree to start with then, which, you know, led to you getting into ground investigations? Good question. Um, so I originate from Spalding in Lincolnshire, an area which uh-huh. you're, you're probably familiar with yourself there, Michael. Um, and as you probably agree, there's not really lo- much to inspire you there from a, from a geological perspective, being flat as a pancake and not really much going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was camping and fishing and climbing and caving that kind of got me into geology, being quite close to exposures uh, down by the riverside uh, a bit of kayaking as well so it was like that whole camping and um, getting away yeah. from lincolnshire getting into peak district going to north wales south wales that kind of thing uh, and seeing these formations were quite inspiring so i decided that you know i'd, I'd get involved in that and I, then i started looking at um, mining quarry and that kind of thing i thought oh, that's probably an industry that i wouldn't mind going into and that's how i ended up applying for a geology degree i mm-hmm. didn't do geology at gcc or a level because the grammar school i went to had closed that geology department like in the 70s or 80s but had all of the yeah. samples and specimens and and books and whatnot so i was quite fortunate that i had a, a very um amenable geography teacher and an amenable chemistry teacher that let me uh, read as much as i wanted to on, on the background of, of geology and mine engineering with these old textbooks covered in dust <laughs> they're well out of date and i think i've still got a few of them now they, they kind of let me keep so that's how i ended up applying for a geology degree because um, mm-hmm. i couldn't really see i wanted to be outside wanted to work outside um, and yeah. i didn't really want to go into to anything that was going to end up with me shackled in an office uh, every single day of the week so that's 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 how i ended up turned on to geology i think i applied to to camborne and to leicester didn't get the, the grades I wanted, to be brutally honest. I, I did all right in my GCSEs and then found the alcohol uh, <laughs> and, the, and yeah. uh, ended up fluffing my FIA levels quite quite dramatically and going through clearing. 
Camborne changed their course from a three to a four year. So I, I still got into Camborne with my grades, but because it was a four year course, I decided probably didn't want that extra level of debt. So I went through clearing and got into Derby University, which happened to be a massive blessing in disguise. Great, yeah. great course. Really, really, really good teachers, the tutors, and the the field work was was amazing. They they really put an emphasis on on the field work side of things, which kind of aligned with where I I wanted to be. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't speak highly enough for Derby University. Seemed to be a bit of a, a rare a beast, really, because there's not many people I've I've met from University of Derby still in the industry, but there are a few floating around. That's that's how I ended up doing three years straight geology. Fair enough. That, yeah, the field work was what drew me onto uh, the geology course as well. And um, field work, being outside, etc., is always is a bit more my my thing. So you you've done your the geology degree. So then you, you were saying earlier on, so you, you started with a company called Flow Gas. So you're taking something unrelated. And so why was why was that then? Why was the initial step into something a bit unrelated to? Two thousand three. I think things have changed a lot since then um, in that back then there were more graduates, there were more courses, there were Derby yeah. University wasn't regarded as particularly prestigious in that, that field. Maybe it hadn't been a university for that long. Um, so yeah. it was hard to get a job in the industry. Um, long and short of it was that uh, you needed to get the experience first. So I thought I'll go for a graduate training program because they'll appreciate um that kind of background i hope uh and i was fortunate enough yeah. to get in with with flow gas and like i say it was it was a good grounding in the corporate world quite early on it was uh, a couple of months like I say in, in each department learning the machinations of you know sales or marketing commercial or transport logistics mm -hmm. and a, you know, a year in i was figuring out you know i want to i want to go in the installations and maintenance department because a, they're pretty switched on guys. They're all engineers. They they have similar kind of background to myself. So after the graduate training program finished, I spent I think about a year or so in the installation and maintenance department, um, working on their emergency team and also dealing with specifying so almost contract management, I guess early form of contract management, specifying oh. installations of underground gas tanks. So there was a there was a crossover with site investigation because if you put a tank full of LPG in the ground and the water table rises, that tank's going to pop out the ground. It's not going to give you the desired effect of an underground storage tank. There was there was SI involved in it um, early stages and trying to take the promises that the salesman had made um, to the customer and make them a reality, which wasn't always possible. There was a lot of managing expectations, <laughs> as you can probably imagine. So, yeah, sure. so that's that's why yeah. I went unrelated, was to break that cycle. But also I was quite grateful that it, it had a bit of a crossover to SI. Yeah, no, that was, I suppose that was quite lucky then, really, wasn't it? They had a bit of a crossover. You, you do see a lot of people coming from university and going into something completely unrelated. At that time, as you say, you know, a lot more competition, a lot more courses. There's, there's not as many courses now, obviously, from what you've said which is a bit of an issue i know there's a few characters in the ground investigation industry trying to push that to get some more courses on um to, to keep keep new blood coming in otherwise eventually it will, it will well it'll be it'll be harder than it even is now to to get decent sort of engineering and drilling staff into the ground investigation game so you've got 18 years experience now as you were saying so what what, what was your kind of your first job like in ground investigations that was a Quite a typical uh, engineering role in, a, say, a small mm -hmm. consultancy. Then it was a family-owned consultancy. They had this was at the time when remediation yeah. was a big thing of, of gas works, that kind of thing. So they they were they had quite a few folks, geo-environmental engineers, in the office that were dealing with remediation plans and whatnot. And I was the the geotechnical bolt on um, uh, that ran in a in a smaller company within Meerbrook. Called Blackbrook, which were eventually absorbed into into Meerbrook as a whole. A gentleman by the name of Simon Hustle gave me my break there. He was ex hider and he was is still is at Meerbrook. Absolute inspiration. I'd say he taught me everything I know, but he he he'd probably be modest enough to say that I've, I've learned a bit afterwards. But it, on the technical side of things, he was straight down the line. He taught me a hell of a lot. Yeah, quite a lot of that was um, you know a couple of days in the office uh, getting ready for a job. And then executing the job, which was 
trial pits, managing CP, so supervising CP, supervising rotary. And I was straight into the deep end mm -hmm. with managing more than one rig on a site and managing trial pits which nowadays, I think, as the, the burden on engineers has increased, the acceptable number of rigs that an engineer can supervise effectively and log has become much reduced. And, but there were, there were instances in yeah. two, three rigs on a site and the wind sampling rig, you know, tapping away in the background and trial pits to do and deliveries to take. And it, yeah. was, just, it was just a bit of a different animal. So, yeah, that's, that was a couple of years of that. I wouldn't say I mastered it in any way, shape or form. I think I probably could have spent a lot more time there and, uh, and no. learned a lot more. But again, the industry was booming. It was that time pre-recession where you could pretty much hold your hand out. Money fell from, from the sky. It was um, a time to mm -hmm. be moving on and uh, get a little bit more salary. Yeah. And Simon, was, again, great guy, understood where I was coming from. There was a limit to what a, a junior engineer could, could earn at, uh, at Meerbrook and uh, quite happy to, uh, to call it a day and, and move on. But one thing I did learn at Meerbrook, another chap there, uh, Peter Lee, who uh, who was a window sampling driller, uh, taught me to window sample, which he was a, a very, very good window sampling driller um, and kind of got me mm -hmm. thinking a bit more like a driller. Now, a lot of people say window sampling is not drilling. It's, it is drilling. I'm not a driller, but uh, he was yeah. particularly adept and pretty much taught me how to, how to deal with difficult characters uh, because he himself could be difficult uh. quite a few times a day. So yeah, that's uh, that's the job. Okay. You touched on different drillers. That's something that we're going to discuss a little bit later on as well. Was it what you were expecting then? Your first kind of job in in ground investigations. Was it what you were expecting? Because um, I know some people go into it and think actually this is not for me. But for your staff, of course, for your history, then that's turned out to be not the case. Yeah. What 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 were you expecting, and did it meet your expectations? I think it differed quite wildly from my expectations, but in a positive way. So I, I was expecting to be in the office a lot more churning out logs and writing reports, okay. which ultimately that's kind of what you're groomed into thinking the ground investigation industry is about. But I ended up doing yeah. a lot more of the, the site stuff and the management um, on site. So that's that was a pleasant um, pleasant surprise for me, really. I think, you know, as time wore on, it would have, meant more and more time in the office and going to senior engineer you don't really do as much time in the office but yeah that was a very pleasant pleasant yeah i bet it i bet it was and so from 2007 2015 you worked as an engineer geologist contracts manager for banel which are now called strategy and techniques so how did yeah. you kind of transition from engineer to contracts manager that was again that was a, a right place at the right time kind of scenario. So Van L Geotechnical, yeah. as was then, was not a very large part of Van L. It was the most profitable in in that, I think it's still the same now, they had the pile testing and site services element of, um, of Van L and they had ground investigation and they were, they were really pushing the ground investigation. They were getting, I think they had a couple of CP rigs and they were, they were expanding on that sort of thing. But again, it all stemmed from one CP rig. And I think that that guy was a contractor mm -hmm. that decided to come and work in house. So okay. they weren't entirely sure what they wanted from an engineer. And I think if you look back now, you could probably define mm -hmm. it as a, as a blended role. They wanted someone with the technical experience of logging to BS5930, but also someone who could manage sites or manage drillers, um, order, install, foresee, difficulties, go out and do site visits, price work. And they, it was a case of, I had that experience, tick those boxes. I had the ability to kind of understand how a site worked and what potential pitfalls there were, and then take it on to the next step. So I was um, looked after quite well there by a chap called Gary Baxter, um, who was the, the operations director ultimately, yeah. but he was, he was my gaffer in the first instance. He's still he, there, I he think, was, isn't he, Gary? He is. Yeah. 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 Uh, it was Gary. And then it was Andy Johnston who is kind of semi-retired now, but they were, they were the two chaps that yes. just were, were pushing that. Yeah. Pushing that forward. So yeah, my, my change, my move to, to Van L coincided with Van L pushing the SI side a lot a lot harder in the run mm -hmm. to the recession and then the yeah. recession hit and everything went to pot pretty much overnight you could see the resources planner was just empty 
Yep. So contract manager wise, there wasn't much need for, for many contract managers. And at that time, Van L was still owned by Mike Ellis and a few shareholders. So it was very much okay. right. Okay. Let's, let's act like a family, but let's, let's cut out, you know, superfluous positions and try to blend things together. So mm -hmm. I think I survived two or three rounds of redundancy and ended up doing a bit of everything, really. A bit of pile testing, a bit of monitoring, again, a little bit of pricing, running jobs, writing reports. And the, the report writing became a, a bigger feature then. Uh, it was it was nearly all factual because a lot of the work that Van Algier Technical got was, uh, let's say it was it was either four smaller sites uh, that they're, someone mm -hmm. had come to them and said, oh, I'm building three properties on this plot in Norfolk. Can you can you can you pile it for me? And then it was a case of us educating them and saying, Well, we can't pile it for you until we've got some ground investigation, so let's let's price this and then do that. So a lot of that stream of work came through to basic factual reports so that uh, other departments within Van El could do the piles, pile design. And then that crossed over in, into a little bit of interpretive on my side of things, which that was the trajectory I thought I was I was going in was okay, right, I've done Sign investigation as a supervising engineer. Yeah, I've done a bit of contract management and and now it's reports and and then I'm gonna then I'm gonna be a consultant and that, that's the way I'm gonna go. So yeah, it was a it was a blend. I got involved in so, yeah. loads of things in Van L that um, I wouldn't have ordinarily got exposed to because of the the fact that we're doing huge open site piling jobs, supervising uh -huh. construction of the railway bridge foundations in Walsall right the way through to dealing with watching briefs on a piling or development called NAREC up in Blythe, where they tested wind turbine blades for destruction. So it was, yeah, really, mm -hmm. really varied. Very, very interesting. I enjoyed my time. Sounds very like you had a good spread of experiences whilst you were there then. So perhaps the, um, you know, it's by a couple of rounds of redundancies, which essentially allowed you to, to gain experience of a much wider variety. In, in terms yeah. of the fundamentals of a contracts manager what, what would you say they are and how would you be a good contracts manager well that's assuming i'm a good contracts manager that's true i would say almost is you've got to maintain honesty and integrity because as soon as you start lying to people they're going to find you out straight away yeah whether that be the client or whether that be the guys that are working for you there's always yeah. you know economical truths to be told like as when a rig's going to come mm -hmm. to site you know that that, that's an element there where people kind of acknowledge that things aren't going to go according to plan. How you handle that is yeah. a very, very important part. You yeah. Know, if, if you're if you're telling little white lies here, there, and everywhere, you're going to get you're going to get cropped. You're going to yeah. Up and uh, you're going to get found. You out. mean when when you say little yeah. white lies, you mean when when someone could be available on site, etc. And you know when the rigs are going to get there, when the work's going to start, that sort of thing. Yeah. You just got to say, look, the the, the rigs overrunning. On, on another site it's not broken down it's, mm -hmm. it's overrunning and you wouldn't want us to take our rig off your site to go to another one and come back and finish it so you know please yeah. accept the fact that we're yeah. running late for whatever reason the client could have had another hole or whatever just be honest just be honest and because you're relying on your drillers telling the same story on that site when they rock up and when the client turns yeah. back and said, oh, you know, do you have a break down last one? Said, no, mate, they added another two holes. You, you, you've, got to, <laughs> you've got to maintain it. Yeah, you get found out. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think flexibility is, is vital for a contract manager because you're not just a contract manager. You're, you're wearing many hats, spinning many plates, and especially if you start dipping into the rail side of things, which I didn't at, at Van L, to be fair. This was before they were, they were big on the rail side of things, but... Since then, you've got to be mm -hmm. on the phone when your guys are working. You can't you can't have a Saturday night shift and not have your phone on. Uh, there's a very, yeah. very good contract manager at uh, a Geotechnical Engineering called uh, Chris Morgan, who's railed through and through, and he's good to his word. You know, if, if, you, if you've if you got a problem at 2.30 in the morning, on a Sunday morning, you phone him, he'll answer his phone, and he'll help you out. Yeah. You don't want to do it too often, though. No, I'm going to say um, not very popular with his missus, I would imagine. No, I, he lives for it. He loves it. Um, and I would say, finally, the financial awareness or commercial acuity of being a contract manager is paramount. Yeah. It's not just what's been billed for. It's managing change. It's seeing where your business is exposed 
to potential loss and you know at the end of the day you're in business to make money and if a client asks for something that's not been priced then you need to make sure it's yeah. discussed agreed priced um and then executed so yeah mm-hmm. in a nutshell i think they make um good points a, uh, a good trifactor there of uh, of um fundamentals for for any contract manager and i think if you go into mm-hmm. the business thinking of those three then you'll you'll do well fair enough what what was the kind of typical day look like for contracts manager there was never such thing as a typical day <laughs> uh never is this, this first is thing in the morning yeah first thing in the morning probably even before you blocked on as it were whether you commute in or whatever you're calling the drillers or calling the engineers anything happened overnight what's yeah. the situation with this morning what's the topic of the daily brief is the install coming today? What do I need to chase up? You know, you're having the conversation with the guys on site before they've started work. Because they're, you know, they're up, crack of dawn. They want to get cracking straight yeah. away. You know, drillers especially, they they want to they want to get the meterage in. They want to go home early on a Friday, same as everybody else. They want the job done. Um, yeah. At the end, with you know, if you're dealing with managing an engineer, it's no disrespect to, to quite a lot of the engineers, but you're trying to G them up. You're trying to, get them to think how you'd like to to be thinking on site especially when you've got a few years under your belt and uh, and get them to double check a lot of the conversations you've had with with drillers and the clients and try to foresee any any issues it's that it's probably that that period of maybe an hour before work's due to start is one of the most important parts of the day second only to the debrief at the end of the day the rest of the day is spent invoicing quoting new works liaising with senior engineers if you're fortunate enough to have a, a senior engineer that's working alongside you to, to write reports and stuff um if not then it's re- write reports scheduling lab tests ordering in store checking in with the client yeah it's it's plate spinning on a grand scale and then at the end of the day like i say yeah. it's, it's the debrief speaking to, speaking to the engineer speaking to the drillers how's it gone what have i done yeah. wrong what could we have done better what's the plan for tomorrow that kind of thing. So a typical day is a bit of everything, really. It's a bit of commercial, it's a bit of contracts, it's a bit of senior engineering, it's a bit of engineering. And if you're a driller, you know, there are, there are good contract managers out there that are, that are drillers. Uh, it's mm-hmm. kind of coaching the, the driller on site as to what you would have done. Quite often the driller on site doesn't want to know. He, he wants yeah. to know that you can just drill every single hole with a, with a um, PCD. But it's like, have you tried improv or have you tried a surface set or... Have we got the right method for? Yeah. Have we have we gone here with with dynamic sampling and rotary follow on? We should come here with CP and rotary follow on. That. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like a lot of organisation then, um, making sure you've got things in mind. You know, being one or two steps ahead, I suppose. Wait for that call. What's what's likely to go wrong here? Let's get things in place. Hopefully, if you have enough resources to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. what what was the the Trying most important thing? I say, what was the most important thing that you learned through your seven years at Van Al? That's a very good question. But I'm gonna I'm gonna open up here and say I've been given one disciplinary in my life, and that was from the owner of yeah. Van Al, which was Mike Ellis. And I okay. Van Al had a a very very good uh, Mike did especially had a, a very good commercial awareness because Mike. If you look back through case law, Mike Ellis left Bullivant. He was he was a manager at Bullivant. I think mm-hmm. it might have been the or ops manager at Bullivant. So he he had a commercial acuity about him that he, he, he pushed onto everybody. And as such, we would do credit checks on every client. Didn't matter whether they've been going, you know, been, been a client of ours for fifteen years, things change, especially when in the run up to the, the economic downturn. Who I I think I priced the job in Sheffield. We won the job. We did the work. We didn't take payment in advance. Normal practice was to, to rock up the site and they, there'd be a, a check there waiting if they, you know, we said to them, your credit check has come back because you, you're not quite in the realms of what we'd like to trade with. So the first couple of jobs, can you give us a check? In advance? Mm-hmm. And I hadn't followed that up. I just kind of assumed that we'd be all right. So the driller didn't, didn't ask for the check, which was my fault for not asking the driller. And then... Yeah. Ultimately, that client didn't pay. So I ended up on the sharp end of Mike Ellis, who, uh, who, and I will paraphrase by, by avoiding what he actually said to me, but he called everybody Sparrow for some reason. I don't know why. It didn't rhyme with my surname. It wasn't that big. Sparrow. Uh, he said to me, you listen, Sparrow. That's my fin money, not yours. And I, I went out yeah. of the room with a red arse. And yeah. theoretically, it is, it is my money. You know, it's my wages. It's his money, but, He's right. Yeah. And he, it's, 
especially from a commercial and contracts perspective, is treating every single penny like it's your own, spend it like it's your own. Don't be throwing money away on yeah. IVCs or whatever. Um, think about what you're buying. Think if you can get it cheaper. If you've got the time, a lot of the time, contract managers that haven't got the time, um, or they've got a, a department that buys for them, but it's it's treating everything like it's your own and fighting for every penny in some cases with with difficult clients. Okay. And then, so you have seven years at Vernell. Then you've moved on to geotechnical engineering, started as a consultant, which I'm surprised to hear because I didn't know they'd done any type of consultancy. Um, but then after five months, you've gone on to the role, um, more of an operational side, really. Is it, is it kind of the operations, the organization? Is that the thing that you're, you're best at? It's the thing I like to think I'm best at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it, you know, there are, there are people out there who know me well who just think, why you're not at all a consultant you're not a detailed person so why did you take that role yeah um, and I, I kind of alluded to it yeah. earlier that it was it was what i believed at the time was a natural progression geotechnical had a couple of yeah. consultants i think they had maybe three as well as a couple of te technical directors there who, who did small interpretive what's and obviously they had the lab so they, they were quite good in that regard they could, they could do everything in the house and i think they had maybe two or three consultants that they that they'd come across from a company that went bump in the recession so there was there was a reasonable um, cluster of, of consultants there the, the, reading between the lines then geotech was heading in a different direction as you can see it's changed quite a lot the past few years and it was regarded as not being as a, a high priority for the business so they were winding it down and they were changing the way they did things so when i when i went there their contract managers i think they priced the work they ran the work they wrote the report they scheduled the labs, um, and then they went on to the next one and the next one and the next one. That five-month kind of change in my role coincided with the contract element of the contract manager's role being stripped off and be called contract managers. The engineering element was stripped off and became called the senior engineering team, and then there was a commercial team as well. So they were split into three teams. They were all former geologists, site engineers, that, uh, apart from a couple of drillers, that ended up playing to their strengths rather than being a jack of all trades uh, and that that worked out well but at the same time the engineering team kind of became consolidated rather than working these loads of individual teams for various contract managers they all became consolidated so rob ewins who was the the engineering team manager then came over to me and said you know we're looking at a manager for an engineering team would you like to do it i said well i've yeah. been here five minutes well, in fact, I started on the same yeah. day as Pat Roberts, who you had on previously. Um, yeah, that, that was that. That was the change. And I, I grabbed it with both hands because I think I'd realised I was a square peg in a round hole with the whole consultancy side of things. And uh, I relished it. And I, I love that side of things because I was able to impart what experience I had on site and my experience at Banel with the new engineers getting things going. So you kind of got both sides then. You've got the operational side. It, it, it's still sort of making use of your experience as an engineer on site and you know, that, that sort of thing. So you were there for a couple of years as an engineering manager, and then you went on to, to yeah. be the drilling department manager. So how was it looking after the drilling side instead of the engineering side? Massively different. People at the time yeah. were saying, you can manage, doesn't matter whether you're a driller, because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you can't manage drillers if you're not a driller. Everyone's saying, you can manage yeah. drillers, it's fine, don't worry about it. You can manage engineers, <clears throat> there's no difference. You've got You've got people working for you who are drillers in the management structure. That can, mm -hmm. that can help you out but it was completely different yeah. and this was yeah. at a time when i think you probably agree the recruitment of drillers started to become quite difficult because people's expectations yeah. were drifting from reality and people coming into the industry didn't want to get dirty they didn't want to get up at four o'clock yes. in the morning they didn't want to work till eight o'clock at night so it was difficult to to maintain a good number i think we were up to like maybe 25 crews at one time, 25 times two plus maybe 10 in the float, nearly 60 people. It was a completely different challenge. I wouldn't say it was any harder than your engineer on site managing a, a difficult driller for the first time in his or her life. Um, it's just you've got 25 of them all at the same time. And now that there were some really, really sound guys there. Some made it very, very, very easy mm -hmm. for me. Some made my life 
difficult for a short period of time, but mm-hmm. it was it was a huge change and brought its own set of challenges. Yeah. So that's the what. So what were the what were the kind of problems that you had to face and overcome moving over then? Initially, it was kind of getting that respect. Some people argue that I I never had the respect of some people because they were just yeah. difficult and didn't want to be managed. But that was mm-hmm. that was the first one is, is getting people on the side, getting them to understand what I was trying to achieve maybe changing the rules that they've been used to for a little while uh, and yep. getting acceptance, which I was there doing that job for nearly five years. I don't yeah. think I had a bad stab at it. I think by the time I was getting up to five years, I had a chat with Lyndon, who was my, my line manager then, and said, look, you know, come five years, this will be this will be me looking at a different role, uh, either within Geotech mm-hmm. or, or, or not. Um, not an ultimatum as such, but just fair warning. I think I think it was probably four years into it. Yeah, yeah, it was hard, hard, hard life. And you know, these guys you're managing there, away from their their families, having bad days here, there, and everywhere. Of course, breaking down, they're bending your ear till whatever mm-hmm. time at night. It's especially with that that number. In some cases, you know, it's, that numbers dwindle now. The, the yeah. bomb isn't as big as it used to be, but yeah, it's, that's a big old monster. And strangely. Completely different set of people to those at, at ADS now. Uh, we can come yeah. into that later, but it's, it's strange how different companies have different personalities. Uh, you know, as a whole, you know, the drillers act differently as a yeah. group. I think Geotech is it had that uh, that pedigree, uh, that provenance of guys, and they they had a very very good support network. Their, their stores were excellent. They never wanted for anything. Their vans were immaculate. Mm-hmm. Their rigs were brand new, um, and, they, and they yeah. did a damn good job. Um, but yeah. Could waffle on about that for hours, I'm sure. So you must have uh, employed a few drillers while you were there then. So what what would you say makes yeah. a good driller? I've employed, or had employed, some very good guys. And I employed some very, very bad guys. Yeah. And I think this stems yeah. to the fact that I'm not a driller. And you kind of take somebody on their word, especially if you're employing a driller, an outside driller, into a drilling company. And there are a handful of guys that ever mm-hmm. ever succeeded doing that. There were quite a lot. I think and you can say you're a driller, but you've been on a rig. You, you're an operator, as it were. But what makes a good driller is the ability yeah. to know what's going down down the hole, thinking about bit choice, thinking about pressures, thinking about hole stability, thinking about flush return. Uh, yeah. And you can you can pretty much gauge most of that from a guy in, in conversation. But also at Geotech, there's a pressure to have X amount of rigs out because that's what your business plan is based around. So you made some decisions that were probably pressurized decisions to take people on um, and ultimately yeah. didn't work out because they haven't got that now. And quite a lot of the guys, I mean, Geotech have a very, very fine training and development structure for their drillers. And a lot of that is, is built around garnering that thought process. But even though you can be armed with whatever bits you want, whatever rigs you want, some guys just don't don't get it. They just select the same bit every single day, every single job, doesn't matter where they yeah. are in the country. And some, sometimes they get it bang on, and sometimes they're wondering why they're you know, getting two, three metres a day. Yeah, just not just not selecting the right bit or having enough foresight, I suppose. And it's just not that. So, I was going to say, it's just, it's just not that thought process. It's not thinking about what's going down, yeah. down at the bottom of the hole. Yeah. So do, do you think what made a good driller 10 years ago is still what makes a good driller now? Or do you think it's changed at all? I'd say probably casting your mind back even further, maybe when I joined the industry 20 years ago, what made a good driller then yeah. was experience. And bearing in mind then what I saw coming into the industry as a, you know, an engineer 18 years ago it was a second man was five maybe ten years as a second man before he became a, as an assistant driller before he became a lead driller so you've got lead drillers there that 30 40 years experience and there's not a lot they haven't seen so even if they don't get what's going down on them you know they're, they're not that adept at, at predicting issues they've been in every single possible scrape in that 30 40 year yeah. period but they know how to get out of it what's changed now is that drillers you know an assistant driller could be an assistant driller for six months. It could be an assistant driller for six years. Some guys, that there are guys at the Geotech now that walk through the door. There's one chap in, in particular, walked through the door, having been a chef, and within a year, he was a lead driller because he was good. So they are out there. Yeah. He gets what's going on down the hole. 
Um, what's changed yeah. now is, is, is more about compliance in addition and tickets in addition to trying to get that experience distilled as quickly as possible. And that's why I think Geotech do, do a good job of training their guys because they have the ability to, to, to distill experience from quite a, a wider range of people put it into text format and uh, and try to mm -hmm. to get the guys to read it and do a good job fair enough how, how do you you think back to all your dealings with drillers how do you deal with a difficult driller what are the sort of three top things or top tips you would give you know engineers or other people listening or, or watching so a lot of that depends but i'm going to say you've got to treat everyone with respect from the outset you've got to give them respect straight away yeah. because the chance of, yeah. you know, they, as, a, as a young engineer they've been doing it a lot longer than you have an engineer and they've, they've seen engineers come yeah. and go and they know that you know whatever percentage let's say 50 percent don't stick it so it's treating with respect yeah. lay your cards out you know early on just say oh, i haven't been doing this this long so i'm going with your experience but i appreciate it if you didn't pull the wool over my eyes because i'm not stupid and i've got people in the office telling me what's what and you're going to get people who want to take the mickey I'm, I'm not going to name names but there are there are you know cp drillers out there that that tried to pull the wool and, and were found out quite early on and it's it's how you deal with that situation it's it's just being respectful you can't have a chip on your shoulder just because you've come out of university with three or four years experience in applied learning you've, you've got to learn everything again so it's okay you earn your degree you've got your degree and then you start your vocation then you learn how to deal with yeah. people and how to do your job again i'll hop back to geotech because there's a lot of experience there in the engineering team and that's that's pretty much how they coach people into it so dealing with difficult drillers treat them with respect don't have to to break down and start effing and blinding them um even if they're doing yeah. it to you just keep stating your case we're both here to do a job we both want to go home early on a friday i'm asking you to go two meters deeper please do it for our both both our sakes really because otherwise we're coming back here on monday and we're doing it all over again sure. okay so respect so that's one what, what else do we have i think it's a bit of give and take so they're going to respect you if you help them so that's not being sat on your backside watching them do the work that's yes getting in the truck with your ibc and going filling up their ibc for them or yeah. writing up their labels or taking the stuff to the, to the skip it's a two-way thing if they see you working, they're gonna they're gonna think, okay, he's one of us. That's fair enough. He's he's, he's trying to get it trying to get it sorted. We're we're on the same page. So it's working together once you've got that. And then ultimately, it's having a laugh with them. You know, the, the humour I think is is the one thing that keeps driller going because they've probably got yeah. a smile on their face even when they're absolutely caked in slurry and muck, bentonite powder, or whatever. <laughs> Uh, it's having that sense of humour and using that humour to diffuse a situation, and often that's at your own detriment. Okay. You know? Yeah, you need a bit, need a bit of humour. It always helps out, especially if it's weather's awful, clients very yeah. choosy and demanding, very particular. Uh, you need to get on with your driller. You can't get on with all the drillers. And the same as the drillers can't get on with all the engineers. Uh, there's difficult mm. engineers and there's difficult drillers, you know, out there because humans are human at the end of the day. When you mentioned something about the, the CP driller pulling the wheel over eyes, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and what, what you mean um, about that? Uh, that? Long and short of it is, is, is not doing SBTs, skipping SBTs. Yeah. It's quite easy to fathom, you know, yeah. when there's a spare SBT uh, shoe sat quite close to the uh, back of the van and a hammer next to it. It's quite easy to see what's yeah. going on. So you, you spend a bit more time looking at them and notice that their progress has slowed down noticeably when you're yeah. close to the rig uh, than when you're, you know, going to the cafe and getting everyone coffee. Mm -hmm. So there's there's, there's yeah. other times like that where yeah. you've got to be on the ball. I think that comes down to, I guess, just acuity in general of, uh, of just thinking about what's going on, predicting how long it's going to take to do this. Whole. And if things speed up all of a sudden, then why is that? Have a chat with them. Uh, yeah. Because ultimately there'll be a reason for it, and you'll 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 know within within an hour whether you've got a good driller or a, or a bad one. Do you think there's enough drillers coming into the industry at the moment? I know uh, recruitment is difficult throughout the ground investigation industry. I know that can provide uh, recruitment services, but drillers, you know, 
young drillers coming in. Do you, do you think there's enough? I know there's a, there's a problem again with with engineers coming in, but on the on the driller side, what do you think that's looking like at the moment? So I can probably draw on the experience at, at Geotech, and I know that they're probably having the same yeah. issues still. Is that that difference between expectation and reality when people come in? Turn the clock back. When I when I started as drilling manager there, it was a lot easier. You take five guys on every month or whatever. For whatever oh. reason, two or three of them wouldn't make it. But by and large, they stuck with it and yeah. they tried to get through. Whereas now, it's one in, one out, one in, one out. The the expectation yeah. I, you cannot sit down in an interview. You know, Clive Hall, who's a who's a planning manager um, at uh, Geotech, and Andy Clark, who's the drilling manager now. They both worked with me when I was drilling manager there. And we sit down in the interview and we say, this job is a crappy job. You're going to be up early. You're going to be home yeah. late. You might not be home for four four nights a week. We might ask you to stay out where you can. You're going to be out in every single weather. You're going to be sweating and you'll be wearing Tyvex in the middle of summer with a respirator on and you'll hate it. Yeah. Middle of winter, you'll be <laughs> completely soaked. Yeah. This is a rubbish job. And they're like, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. I love outdoors. I, lo- I love it. I love the adversity. Yeah, brilliant. Two weeks into the job. I'm not coming in today. I can't cope with it. And I don't know how yeah. you can align people's expectations with the reality anymore by telling them in an interview how bad the job is. That's what it, you'd laugh about it, but that, that's, that's what we were reduced to, telling them you've applied for a terrible job. It's not a terrible yeah. job because if, if you're that kind of person that no. loves it and there are every, every yeah. driller out there must love it in order to do it because you're a different breed. So, yeah, the, there are not enough drillers coming in the industry because there's this discord in, in expectation and reality that I just can't fathom unless you want to go back and revert to blaming social media and people checking their phones every five minutes and seeing, you know, brand new, brand new cars because I'm an Instagram influencer or whatever. And I'm, I'm staying in all these hotels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just can't, can't get my head around it. I don't want to blame that. I want to say there's, there's another reason for it, but it's hard to, to kind of get your head around because there's not enough people coming in the industry. Um, and the ones that the no, it's, today. it's a it's a different. I mean, we we recruit drillers for ground investigation companies, and they it, they are a different breed to to deal with and to to get hold of. And actually, I think for them to trust you, I'd, mm-hmm. I would say on average we we'll deal with drillers, deal with engineers. There's definitely a bit less trust with the the drillers. It's probably a little bit like they, they're less used to dealing with recruiters as well. I'd say most of them generally don't have a CV written up. Um, so we'd usually help them with, with that. But, um, yeah, I mean, getting a, a decent recruitment company in to help with any recruitment is, is always a wise idea, of course. In, in yeah. terms of female drillers, have you, have you ever seen a, female driller on site there's, there's a big push for you know engineers um female engineers essentially do you think the the drilling industry should be doing the same do you think that would make sense yeah i see no reason why not absolutely i think it's a great idea yeah i think in in my time at geotech i only had one application from from a female to, to be an assistant driller and she was off an interview yeah. and didn't turn up for the interview but I don't see any reason why not. It's, it's probably not marketed in such a way. We, I think we're, we're probably a few years behind construction yeah. in that regard. Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree. I think if anyone knows any female drillers out there that would like to come on a podcast, feel feel free to put them in touch with myself because it would be quite interesting to hear from their side what it's what it's like. Just generally as a, a driller, I suppose, but you know, partly in relation to because it is extremely male dominated, especially engineering is but then drilling that is you know it's almost exclusively really like say i've never yeah. met i've never met anyone myself on site who's uh it will change it, 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 yeah it's just that we're we're just lagging behind construction 20 years ago 18 years ago there were there weren't many women on construction sites and now yeah it's the diversity is 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 great but it's uh i don't think we as a as an industry as a whole market drilling engineering mm-hmm. as much as we yeah. probably could do and we see a lot of male dominated yeah. businesses as a result i mean there are there are businesses out there like concept for example and that debuts at the top 
that's brilliant. It's great to see. I think yeah. Softec likewise, but there are still many, many ground investigation contracts out there that are just dominated by the male management team or the directors, whatever it may be. And it's hard to, to break yeah. that up because, unfortunately, there aren't that many uh, women that are in a position to, to go up to the next level. And those that do are you know, overlooked in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Natalie, um, Natalie Buse from Concept, she'll be coming on as a guest in the not too distant future. So it'll be good to have a conversation with, with her because there's not many female MDs. There are, there are a few I think over the top of my head at the moment, but, um, perhaps work in progress. More can become, yeah. you know, that level, make the decisions for their businesses. Yeah. Yeah. So then you, then you've moved on to strategic operations manager where you're tasked to develop yeah. subcontract work. How did you do that? And do you have any tips for networking? This is at uh, GEL still, isn't it? Yeah. So towards the end of my time as drilling manager, there was a decision to, I guess it was, it was partially due to the fact that we were struggling to recruit um, drillers and you can only train at a, yeah. you know, a rate of X amount because you want to maintain that quality of uh, and and technical prowess, as it were. So, the decision was made to yeah. to subcontract more rotary work. Now, as you're probably aware, geotechnical engineering don't have cushion rigs. They have rotary rigs. They have slope climbing rigs. They have wind sapling rigs. So, uh, they'd always been subcontracting CP work, but to subcontract rotary work, that was a new animal. So, I was, I was kind of doing two roles whilst I was drilling manager, uh, and a lot of that was blending in subcontractors. And where do you start when you, I'll, I'll be quite honest, working in geotechnical engineering, you've got a bit of a superiority complex because you know how much you train your guys. You know, you train your drillers for months and months and months. You train your engineers. Your, your engineers are training minimum three months, I would say, um, before they're let anywhere near sites. Really, really good. So you just think, well, we've got our best guys. So who's going to come any close? Who's going to come close to, to our level of quality? So you end up going through pretty much the yellow pages and picking from yeah. the contractor and going, right, we're going to put you on that job. We're going to give you a crown. And you make lots of mistakes by getting the wrong guys. And that's essentially how we developed the subcontract network at Geotechnical Engineering was, was making loads of mistakes and getting some really, really good contractors in, like ABS drilling, um, to kind of support us in that. Uh, yeah, develop from there. So we, we got we got a good array of subcontractors on the rotary side. Um, I think the last crowd we ended up with a with a crowd of maybe three subcontract drilling companies having used at least three times that amount over the period of the year. Um, ended up with ADS and Rotor Drill was on the one. Richie Clark and Alex Clark at Rotor Drill, good guys as well. Um, but yeah, work. It wasn't so much just about quality of drilling that was important but it was that cultural alignment of knowing what you wanted to achieve and them understanding what you wanted to achieve they weren't just coming up with a rig and doing the job yeah. keying themselves into the program and invoicing and payments and installation materials and helping each other out it was it was mm-hmm. a partnership so it was it was quickly spotting who wanted just to come up and be a driller and who wanted to help us achieve what we were saying to achieve. Uh, yeah. And I started at zero on that sort of thing. The CP was a lot easier because we had a couple of CP contractors that we used. Chad yesterday was, was one of them towards the towards the end there. But yeah. Davey Allen, Rob Foster, Neil Forrester, one-man bands that are just old school that, that were around 20-plus years ago. And they, they hadn't changed. They were still the best out there. Um, but... Tips for networking. Uh, I don't know. It's just talking to people. I went and met most people out there that we ended up using. Just being quite honest and saying what we wanted to achieve. It wasn't about just being a driller for us. It was about sharing the outcome, where we wanted to be, yeah. sharing the pain <laughs> in some cases. So yeah. yeah. Tips. Tips for networking. That's a broad one. Just, just be yourself. Just tell them. Just tell people what you what you're trying to achieve. Be personal, yeah. be amenable. Yeah, I'm sure of it. Sorry. Networking Broad events, answer did you there. any of those? A couple of VDA things. I mean, bear in mind that um, a lot of that networking, a lot of that last couple of years of my time at Geotech, uh, strategic operations manager, 
which is where I ended up. I ended up just just doing the subcontract management side of things of, of everything yeah. management companies through so brilliant contractors. Um, that was during COVID. I was still drilling manager as COVID hit, and then the year or so after that, yeah, DG operations manager. So it was, it was difficult to network um, and socially distance, as it were. Back end of that, we pretty much established ourselves. A lot of it was done over the phone, so it was. I didn't meet a lot of these guys till, yeah. till late on. Uh, but yes, the BDA um, seminars, I tried to get to a couple of those. I'd like to have done more, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, we did try to, myself and Sam Theophilus, we did try to um, have a look at Europe and see whether we could break into Europe. So we ended up going out to Frankfurt to uh, a tunneling conference called Stuva. I would have loved to have done some more of those um, types of things. Yeah. Because seeing how the Europeans do business is, is completely different to the way we do business. But just really how so climate side of things uh in germany especially they are so direct and there's no small talk it's very much okay what can you do what can you do for me that's not good enough okay thanks bye. nice that's how it was okay. it was quite brutal it was yeah, yeah. There's, there's no beating around the bush it was it was quite quite forthright i enjoyed the experience yeah. but I, as i understand uh -huh. it especially with Germany, is, it is quite um, compartmentalised that they do business in, in areas that they're not so nationwide, especially the drillers. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think my experience, and second-hand experience, I'll say, because GSEC did a little bit of work in France, uh, is that the French guys, by and large, aren't as good or as quick or as technically minded as as what Geotech yeah. Engineering put out. And we drilled side by side on, on the site down in Montpellier there. Um, several years on the trot, and and each time the the company, the American company we're working for, were like, well, we just want to use you guys, but we have to at least engage the French drillers to yeah. show that we're using local labour rather than bringing you all the way down here for a jolly. In mm -hmm. some cases, as they they uh, they thought it was, but I think the guys yeah. on site will disagree that working in thirty degree heat, sweating, sweating. <laughs> Your uh, your daily intake yeah. out is uh, is not exactly easy. No, no, it's definitely not. I I was actually asked to find I think there's a couple of contract engineers for that by the old BD person Sam. I think he's gone back actually now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He left and he has he gone gone back now. That's right, isn't it? He's gone back as BD manager. Yeah, he's just, he's just joined again. Bid bid manager here. Yeah, he was uh, Doctor Saw and Partners. Saw and Partners. That's it. So you must have uh, you must have ordered a fair few subcontractor engineers then whilst you were at GEL. How what what kind of process did you did you have to choose engineers to use? I didn't. That's the thing. I, I did a bit, but that was when I was you in the engineering it. team. Right? Yeah. Uh, so and the engineering manager. Yeah, actually, yeah. The en the engineering went myself and the engineer who, Claire, who's the engineering team manager now, uh, engineering department manager now. We were both engineering team managers of a team each. So that's when we first dipped our toe in the water of contract engineers. Okay. So my my experience kind of was, it's outdated now, uh, but got a little bit of experience on the, on the subcontract engineer side of things. And we tended to go back then uh, direct. I think the agency side of things is, is something that Claire's looked at over the past three or four years because the shift in the move away from fixed overheads. So it's a lot easier to manage subcontractors um, and reduce your overheads yes. if you've not got the workload on. But I can answer whatever questions you've got on that and, and apply whatever experience I have and second-hand experience from working with Claire and, and seeing what difficulties she faces. Yeah, but what are the kind of typical features you think would make it a good subcontract engineer if you can draw on your past experiences? To answer that again the features certainly speaking from geotechnical engineers perspective would be the technical side of things the ones that the, the guys yeah. that that always get repeat business from geotech are those that can that have mastered the technical output the, the login that they need to be on a par with what what geotech themselves provide but also um the commercial and financial acuity of treating a job as though they're managing it for the company yeah. um, themselves, yeah. not just 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 taking a wage, as it were. Which there are there are two types of contracts out there. There are those that are buying into it, that are sharing in the success, and those that are 
almost mercenary in their approach to it that they're a body on site. They won't go and help out yeah. water running or they won't do this. Yeah. I'm here to log and that's all I'm doing. That's fair enough. Yeah. But there'll only be one job in it for you and that's this one. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. So you'd so say in it's... summary, <laughs> someone that, in summary is someone that can master the technical side of things, but also help out everywhere else and buy into it. And quite a lot of the, the contractors that the Geotech use are ones that are, you know, repeat contractors, but also they, they employ guys that used to work for Geotech, you know, Imogen Soli. Yeah, yeah. She used to be an engineer at Geotech. She's a regular contractor. Gentleman called Sam yeah. Bynan, I've used him a few times. He used to work for Geotech. There's a regular yeah. chap as well, Steve, Steve Pack. I think he's, he technically he's, he's up there with, with the, the top guys at Geotech. He loves it. He loves the technical side. Yeah. Um, and he invariably gets gets jobs with Geotech. Um, it's yeah. There's so many engineers. I think that they've used once because they're just they're not they're not keen into that shared responsibility. Yeah, yeah. It helps it helps to to use people that you you've used before. And obviously to get to get references from people, which most of the the clients we deal with if we send them over some details or a handful of contract engineers they will kind of go and do their due diligence first before essentially ordering anyone um they also kind of have a look at their their own unique little blacklist which a lot of the companies have um you know perhaps engineers experience that it didn't quite work out um for one reason or another essentially so uh, yeah most of the companies they have their little Little black book list. Did, did you ever have that? Did you ever see anyone's kind of little black book list? I think it would be more a case of where there was a significant misalignment in um, in the quality of technical output. Yeah. If, if someone was past help, if you know what I mean. Because Geotech put yeah. a lot into yeah, yeah. Their, their contract engineers. There are guys um, that will go out and help them, them log and then get them tuned in. But even after that mm-hmm. level of help, if you if you're not getting it, then there won't be repeat business for you. And similarly, the attitude that is a big thing as well. And, but I'm not aware of a, yeah. of a of a list. There'll just be people that you know they've had experience of in the past, and they they wouldn't be the first choice. They they yeah, use them probably in extenuating yeah. circumstances where we're desperate, and we you based upon our experience with them, we know that they could do X Y Z job without any issue. And they, yeah. There are means to an end to, to fulfill that position. Yeah, attitude is one of the most important things. I think I'd rather have someone with a good attitude and not quite as sharp skills than sharp skills, but a poor attitude because, you know, it's, it's just not going to work out in any company. It's essentially a, what can be like yeah. a hip on the shoulder, really. And that's, that's only ever going to work yeah. out badly. So now that you've ended up with ADS Drilling as an associate director, um, can you tell us a little bit more yeah. about that? I mean, what's your main focus of your role, etc.? It's, it's many, many focuses. So I brought in in October. I'd worked with with Luke and Connor for quite a few yep. years uh, as sub, uh, as um, strategic operations manager. So I knew what they're all about. Yeah, <clears throat> I like the way that uh, they're always striving to achieve um, perfection and not professing to be the best in any way, shape, or form. And so brought me in to generally take my experience and and take them up to the next level with compliance and health and safety and and that kind of thing so even though that's not necessarily my strengths it's something i've been working on in certainly the last couple of years at geotech the first few months i focused on getting us through our risks audit our um, rail audit risks uh audited and um uh, we are moving into that sector but on top of that there's day-to-day running of it as well it's quoting works it's speaking to the guys managing clients expectations programming the work working on a new website which it isn't going to be live for a little while yet but that's another thing again and then this this strategy is long-term strategy as well fresh off the back of a mm-hmm. meeting with luke and connor on, on friday about you know the next five years and what we want to achieve where we want to go treating the next year with a degree of trepidation and intrigue really yeah, fair enough. So I know the, the focus though, is sorry. Actually, the, the focus is probably know, um, is the, the compliance side of things. It's making sure that we're you know okay. our rams are spot on uh, and generally getting making sure that we're we're delivering what we say we can do, which we seem to be doing. Okay, so you 
was it a deliberate move to move away from the engineering side, would you say, or is it just kind of the chips that fell like that for you? A bit of both, really. I, I couldn't really see myself going back to engineering unless I went back as a contract engineer on site. That would be uh, something I would consider when I didn't have as many financial uh, restrictions like children. But, uh, they are restricted. It's not something that really was on the horizon uh, right right now. That's mm -hmm. Moving away from the engineering side is, is not permanent. I think once you're an engineer, you're always an engineer. You still pick up a copy of BS5930 yeah. and, and refresh how to, to log things. But I'd say it was a, a deliberate decision, ultimately, to move away. Otherwise, I'd be looking for, for engineering type roles. Um, Luke and mm -hmm. Connor kind of popping up and and saying to me, do you fancy joining us? Music's my ears, really. Yeah, fair enough. What's, what's your favourite thing? What's your favourite kind of thing to do in your current position then? I like going outside and meeting the guys, auditing the guys, because mm -hmm. I think they'll appreciate that I'm not auditing them. I'm auditing what we're doing for them and kind of measuring how effective we are at providing them with the gear they yeah. have to do their job. It's one day a week at most, which is not a lot, but that's the bit I enjoy the most is going inside because drillers at ADS, they're just, they're just spot on, just tuned in. Happy, happy crowd. Seem to love their job. So yeah, that's, that's the bit I enjoy. I enjoy most. Getting out there, chatting to the, chatting to the drillers and uh, making sure it's all going right, essentially. Learning yeah, from uh, what's meeting happening. the client as well. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah, and bringing it yeah. back because uh, Luke and Connor, they're both drill day in, day out. They're, they're hands on, hands on guys. So feeding back to them, you know, what we're doing, well, yeah. what the guys are suggesting we do, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's said between the drillers and myself that doesn't go any further because you know, that's an element of integrity that you've got to keep. That they want to have a bit of a bend your ear a little bit. And there's some bits that you can certainly say, well, yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's worth passing on to, to Luke and Connor. For us to act upon and, and improve yeah. everyone's day to day. So yeah, that's, that's fair enough. What I'd like to speak to you about next is rig cancellation and delays. How do you cope with that? Because that happens on a regular basis, doesn't it? Happens on a regular basis from it from does. our side, whether it's a contract engineer. How, how does it? How do you deal with the rig cancellation and delays from the, the drilling side? We employ cancellation charges within okay. five days, or five working days, that'll be. Mm -hmm. Delays, I think you can accept. I mean, cancellation charges are, they're a fact of life nowadays. They weren't a few years ago, but I think certainly since the recession, that lack of experience and the desire to go, go, has led to many, many contracts out there getting their fingers burnt. Technical engineering used to do yeah. it. ADS mm -hmm. do it. Most contractors do it. And it's something yeah. that I think boils down to consultants, maybe. I don't want to tar them with this brush, but I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing quite a lot here. But if, uh -huh. if people are hedging their bets that a job's going to come off and there's no yeah. disincentive to book somebody, they're going to book them and then cancel yeah. them and the job doesn't come off. Whereas if there is a, is a financial disincentive, then they're going to think twice about things. Um, and it's discretionary at the end of the day. If you've got a good relationship with the client and it's a one-off and they've cancelled and it's their client's fault, then you say to them, look, can you get that money back from your client? Can you pass this cost on? Yeah. If the answer is yes, say, pass it on. If it's no, then look, is there any way we can kind of work together to get this back in the next couple, three jobs and work it that way? It's not, it's not there to penalise people. It's there to make people think twice. And a delay is a delay. You just got to accept the fact the jobs are on the back. I mean, we used to be absolutely dogged with it at geotechnical engineering with the larger things. You know, the larger jobs, three, four, five rig jobs with twice that number of engineers, it starts on X date. You know damn well it's not going to start for another month. But the client's yeah. hedging their bets for this date and it just rolls on. It steamrolls your program. And before you know it, you've lost mm -hmm. the best part of a month's worth of operational effectiveness and income because that job's just rolled and rolled and rolled. And that, yeah. that's pretty damaging. You probably don't see that yourself, but uh, that can have a huge knock-on effect because if then, you know, if, if a company the size of Geotech Engineering have got five rigs available and 10 engineers for a month and they know that it's gone from the 1st of February to, you know, the 1st of March, they're going to be scrubbing around, cutting their rates to fill those gaps. Yeah. And there's a knock-on effect because the other contractors have got work, no order in, 
someone hears the geotechnicals knocking out rigs for a thousand pound a day and therefore mm -hmm. the work goes that way that then affects that contractor and that contractor has to lower their rate or has to do something so it's damning and it's damaging but it's a fact of life and the only way you can deal with it is is by rig cancellation charges or managing yeah. expectations no i'd agree a can cancellation charge uh, i think should be industry wide really because you have to be able to to plan your you know the, the time period ahead whether it's a few months or or longer but if you if you can't do that and if you can't get the, the cash flow in then at some point you know it can have a seriously negative effect on our business yeah yeah absolutely absolutely you got to just think of the uh, just digs for example you know if you're if you're paying out yeah. digs every night um you've started to to mobilize things you've started to speak to transport companies to get x y and z delivered even yeah. five days even five working days is is a bit of a kick in the teeth but it's yeah i think it's an acceptable norm that people have come to you know, agree with really yeah and it's all that i suppose it's all that reorganization again isn't it it's you've got everything set up this this falls through for whatever reason now you kind of have to put in a huge amount of effort again to get it back to the same level in terms yeah. of you know booking out your rigs for this client and, you know making sure they've got everything they need making sure you've got engineering oversight whilst you're there as well it's uh yeah, yeah. it can be it can... yeah and it's how you as a contractor deal with your client as well a lot of that you know you don't want yeah. to be an arse about it you just want to say look it it it's cost us time and yeah. energy and a bit of money yeah and this is why we do it you know, it's it's not it's nothing personal. We just need to cover our costs mm -hmm. because if we carried on and every job was like this, we wouldn't be here yeah. providing you with the service at the price you're you're quoting. You would have to find a more expensive contractor or a, a con contract yeah. with lesser quality. And I think they realise that. But yeah. I've not met a con uh, a client at uh, ADS that isn't reasonable and doesn't appreciate our position. You know, you had Wes on um, the other day. We work for Wes mm -hmm. on the project at the moment one of the most reasonable guys you can ever expect. But again, that yeah. their, Wes's frustration was that his, his job was getting rolled back and there were, were issues with that starting off. But just having that good mm -hmm. relationship with the client and, and having the communication, understanding when the job's likely to go off and, and what the ramifications are if it, if it doesn't. So yeah, hats off to Wes for that and, and bam. Yes, no, good good guest of the uh, Grand Investigation podcast as well. Interesting fellow. So last couple of things to to go over now so we're coming to the end but if you could change one thing about grand investigations with a click of a finger what would it be and why day rate everything on a day rate day I mean, rate the yeah each which is the one thing yeah. that is, is archaic and should be left behind uh, and i know there are consultants out there um that say oh we want to we want to pay meterage uh, because we, we don't yeah. know what we're getting i think if if everyone today rate you would soon separate the wheat from the chaff. Some clients, I think, will accept a poor drill crew coming to site and not achieving meterage. And then because they haven't achieved meterage, they'll go, well, didn't achieve the meterage, but he turned up on site and they did drill. And okay, yeah. it's cost us three more days in engineering, but it's fair enough, we'll use them again. Whereas if it's day rate, that client would not be happy with that driller doing three meters a day on every yeah. single job they would stick with a company that, that would do 15 meters a day rotary or whatever so yes i think that would be a, a huge step change in the way the industry carried on and i think quite a lot of the guests that you've had on um in a similar position to myself would probably agree with me there i know mark lindell definitely yeah no 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 i bet he would so what what's the best thing about working in the ground investigation industry for yourself for me it's just a variety um like i've alluded to previously if i was just stuck doing technical stuff day in day out uh i'd yeah. go loopy it's the fact that it's it's plate spinning and it's various things um getting involved uh -huh. in, you know no one would have said to me in my last year of university right okay if you go into gi you're going to be dealing with compliance audits websites uh that kind of thing yeah i probably would have looked at them like they had two heads but now that's that's the one thing that makes me tick it's that variety of, of turning my hand to whatever whatever i can so yeah variety is the one thing that i love about working in the gi industry that's now but that was also on site 
Mm-hmm. That was logging. That was dealing with deliveries. That was dealing with sample dispatches. That was having progress meetings with the client. Uh, it's that level of variety that, that makes it. Amazing. And I think a lot of the people I've met in the industry, engineers through mm-hmm. to directors, love that variety as well. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a good industry for variety. Definitely hit the nail on the head with it there. So, do you think you'll always be in ground investigations? Yeah, I you do. Left a long time ago, if it wasn't for me, yeah, yeah I, I don't, I don't see the reason why I, I wouldn't stay in it now. It's it ticks all the boxes. I, I think, generally speaking, the mm-hmm. industry, or the individuals in the industry, aren't paid uh, a commensurate amount of what they provide to society. Yes. Yeah. I think you look at how how hard a driller works and how hard a piling foreman works. I think uh-huh. a rotary driller works harder than a piling foreman in many respects, and yet would be paid okay. half, three quarters what a piling foreman would yeah. be. And I'm not doing a disservice there to, to piling contractors because I've worked there and I know what they're doing. I know they have a hard life, yeah. but because they're so close to construction, they get paid for the concrete and steel they put in the ground, whereas the data that ground investigation provide engineers and drillers is not yeah. held with the same level of, of weight. And I think that's a terrible shame. There's definitely um, pilers. Well, the pilot industry definitely placed a few pilot estimators, people of that ilk. And when you compare their salary to a ground investigation estimator, that's a huge difference, huge difference in, in, yeah. in terms of that. And also in the designer side as well. The piling is definitely... From from all experience we've had a deal with pilot companies, it's definitely better paid on many levels. I'm surprised. So I I would say in for the ground investigation industry, I would say the engineers get it worse than the drillers, um, because the engineer, a lot of the companies will still will just pay you for the ten hour day. They won't have overtime. It will just be salaried. You know, you know, all the travel etc. in there as well. I say when you compare that to a to a lead rotary driller. You know, I'd say this is quite different. You know, the lead rotary driller can often get, whether it's meterage or bonus or staying away, etc., some kind of bonus. So when I'm speaking to the drillers, I'm, well, I used to be quite surprised on how much they were actually taking home because um, some of them can earn some yeah. pretty good salaries. Some of them work for companies and they, they don't get paid very good salaries, but that's why they have to pick up the phone and, and move on, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I think. Um... Well, the, the exception of the rule, certainly my experience is, is geotechnical engineering. It really, I think the engineers that end up landing a job at geotechnical engineering first, I think Pat Roberts will probably agree, is you do get really looked after on the financial level. You get overtime for every hour that you work beyond. You get your overnights. You're paid very, very similarly to a driller. I think that's because they're a drilling contractor and they have an engineering division that like, they don't want that disparity between drillers and engineers, so they, they yeah. pay them quite well. Um, whereas yeah. I think other companies, like you say, it's 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 10 hours and, and that's your lot, and you're expected to work longer than that, and you're expected yeah. to travel, you know, God knows how long. Exactly. Um, now, I'd say, you know, be honest, I'd say some, some companies pay a shockingly low salary, and they expect a lot for it quite frankly. Well, I mean, we don't really deal with those companies anymore because it's very hard to find people for those companies and it's harder for them to last much of a duration at those companies because why would they accept a lower salary um, going forward? Because everyone has bills to pay, you know, families to feed and new uh, prices of electricity and gas to keep up with, etc. It is yeah. quite surprising. And I always think that if you, you know, if you have a business and you can only survive by paying you know, rock bottom prices and cutting corners at every every opportunity, then it's time for you to shut your business down and move along and allow someone else to fill that, you know, with with a better a better company essentially. So a profitable company that pay a reasonable amount of money to their engineers and drillers. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for Coming on the Ground Investigation podcast, we have come to the end of our show. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. No, it's been a pleasure to discuss things with yourself. So this will be, uh, yeah, we'll get it out for next Thursday. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time coming on today. Most appreciated. And went through, you know, some 
some good topics, some interesting topics there for people in engineering and in the, the drilling side as well. So thanks very much again. No worries. Thanks. I really appreciate you having me on. And uh, yeah, best of luck with it. And uh, I look forward to uh, listening to myself growing on. It's horrible listening back to yourself, but you, you might have a different opinion on that.